So where we left off last time uh, with sociography, um, the techniques of documenting uh, the human body in spatial framings, uh, the body in relationship to the spatial framings and the body in relationship to other bodies within spatial framings is very directly linked to phenomenology, which is very much at the core of architectural uh, thinking and experiencing. And so uh, it's quite natural progression from the ideas of phenomenology relating to universal human experience in space of ourselves and others and of the spaces themselves. And to go from that to sociography, which is the more formalized uh, documentation and analysis of the relationship between human bodies, uh, the spaces that frame them in a graphic, using graphic and video techniques, and trying to understand what uh, these anal analytical techniques can tell us, um, and what they might mean uh, politically, um, in terms of some of these things that we've, these engagements between uh, bodies and spaces and people and each other in spaces. And so there's a connection between this sociographic analysis and the topic of this week, which is traffic. And um, whether or not any of us have ever seen anything like this before, or experienced, uh, how many people have been in uh, road accidents, either cars and cars, uh, cars and bikes, cars and pedestrians? Um, wow. So let the record show that three of you do not have your hand up. It's knock on wood. Um, so is this going to behave badly again? So the um, so we know from we seem to all know from personal experience that uh, there is something problematic about these spatial engagements between bodies. How many people were involved in something where um, at least one of the participants in the accident, so-called, was not clothed in metal and glass? That is a pedestrian. Someone, someone was a pedestrian. So um, in that case, did the pedestrian run into another pedestrian? How many people have had an accident where one pedestrian ran into another pedestrian? Yeah, and it results in an accident report in police. <laughs> um, but you, you've run into people? I've, I've run into people and objects. And things. <laughs> Multiple times? Yeah. <laughs> okay. A few times. Well, maybe we shouldn't ask. But, um, but it's rare, right? That's very strange, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's rare. Why is it so rare? For all the cars there are in the world, there are more people passing other people. How come we don't run into each other? What? Not traveling. We're traveling within our capacity to control our vehicle, our, our bodies. Like our space. Yeah, we have this reaction to, we have this whoop, whoop, you know, alarm system. Um, what's another way to explain it? Self-awareness. Self-awareness, and what word would we use if we were in this class? Reflexes. Our reflexes, right? We come around the corner and, you know, it's, it's, we don't think about it. We, oh, please. And so there were two things that happened there. My, my precognitive response was to pull back. I have control over my, my body, but not in a conscious way. It's my reflex. Um, we are all embedded, we are all uh, equipped with Jedi-like reflexes when it comes to not running into people and walls. The other thing, did you see what the next thing I did? I said, oh, please, I'm sorry, please, excuse me, please. So there's a social component. 
And they're both important. And that's one of the insights of looking at this stuff. It's not just reflexes. It's reflexes along with the social component. There's a social component to reflexes that are crucial. Now, why would that be different with cars? <clears throat> it's kind of a remote thing, right? Um, oh, I'm about to hit someone. Which button should I press? You know, part of it is reflexes, and that's why we don't have more crashes. Um, but there's another thing. I mean, I've said this before. Given what we're doing out there every day uh, in cars, it's a miracle that the death rate is not higher, isn't it? I mean, it's probably hard to realize this because this is one of those things that you don't see because you see it all day, every day. So it becomes invisible. It's like scientists have shown that fish very rarely talk. They don't have a word for water. Okay? If fish could talk, they wouldn't have a word for water because they don't know what life is like without water. So it doesn't even enter their consciousness. They don't even think, you know, water, you know, what's wrong with this guy? Um, it's like that. Driving is like water. It's like breathing. Uh, we don't even know what we're doing because we do it so much. But one of the things we're doing is when we turn 16, we send our, our you know, everyone to the into the world of automobility and it takes several weeks or months even with these young uh, formable minds you remember uh, to develop reflexes to develop automatic reflexes so in a split second there's avoiding the crash there's hitting the brake there's hopefully using the turn signals please uh, hopefully there's looking in the mirror please before changing lanes that would be great um, but it's a matter of developing reflexes and reflex responses. And it's amazing how well it works. Now, scientists are telling us, as amazing as this works, machines can do better. And we'll get to that. Um, but then there's the social thing. What happens to the social thing in these types of situations? There's a social thing at work. Adam Smith in Capitalism, he says, um, he, says, he says some very nice things. He says, if everyone is making rational choices for their own self-interest, the net result will be the best things for society will come to pass. If supply arises to meet the demand, naturally, the best possible outcomes will come to pass. Well, we know that's true, right? Because we demand good things, good things come to us, we get iPhones, and the world is filled with examples of where that is exactly true, that that does happen. But then there's this. There are other examples of the opposite being true. People making choices in their own self-interest result in nutty things happening, resulting in different forms of collective insanity. Um, have you heard of the tragedy of the commons? The tragedy of the commons is, in a way, the counterpoint to Adam Smith's capitalism. If Adam Smith is saying the invisible hand will provide for us, market forces will provide for us according to our best collective self-interest, the tragedy of the commons looks at something else. It's based on a story of uh, every village in New England has a village green. You've, you've seen that. There's one over here in Boston Common, Cambridge Common, Arlington, Concord, every town has what's left of what their common was. And the farmers would line their houses up around the common, and their farmlands would stretch out behind the houses. And in between the houses was the village green. 
At the top was the Congregational Church where everyone got together on Sunday. And in the middle was a symbol and an instrument for collective decision-making, for the common good. It was the field where any of us in the village can graze our cattle. Sounds great, right? We own it collectively. Not so different from this. And uh, the point is that each of us can put two or three cows out there. They can munch on the grass. And everybody's happy, right? But what happens when uh, I decide I want to put 22 cows out there? And everybody else has one or two or three cows out there. And all of a sudden, now there are 84 cows in the common. And that's too many. And everybody suffers, including me. I suffer as well. But at the end of the season, I'm suffering the same amount as the other people there. You know, the grass isn't allowed to renew. It's getting kind of muddy. The carrying capacity of the land is actually dropping. And so the productivity of the land is dropping. But, and so we're all suffering. But at the end of the season, my neighbor uh, gets the benefit of slaughtering two cows. I get the benefit of slaughtering 22 cows. So the incentive structure of me looking out for my best self-interest is to reduce <coughs> the carrying capacity. Whoever puts the most cows in the field wins. And the ultimate result of that formulation of self-interest is the rapid, accelerating uh, destruction of that resource. That is the tragedy of the commons. When there is a collective resource that is for the benefit of everyone, whoever uses it the most gets the most benefit and shares the impact of the downside. Um, and so this is the tragedy of the commons. This is one of the most forceful arguments for the failure of capitalism. And there's a lot of people working all day, every day for a lot, many decades to try to figure out how to bring what econ capitalism calls the negative externalities of the economic system, to bring those negative externalities into the economic system. So that if you're going to pollute, if you're going to produce nuclear waste, if you're going to uh, pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it's going to cost you. And by setting a price for the privilege of deteriorating the collective resources, by doing that, economic forces can now play on what had been externalities. Now they're brought into the economic system in a negative feedback loop. The more, you, uh, the more cows you put in the field, the more you have to pay for the upkeep of the field and maybe the extension of the field to some other location. That's, by, that's, the take, that's a strategy for taking that uncompensated benefit and bringing it into the economic system and taming it with market forces. That's what cap and trade is. Have you heard of cap and trade? If you want to dump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it's going to cost you. Um, Europe does it. We don't. We tried to do it. It was shot down. Um, but that's the kind of strategies we're talking about. Driving is like that. And so uh, the example that Josh is working on is very much about taking the externalities and bringing them in, internalizing them. It feels like, hey, man, stop taxing me. But it really is... Uh, a rational step to setting a price for the privilege of reducing the availability of a finite resource for other people. And so this is uh, just an example of some of the strategies that are being employed. Um, so the thing about the social aspect, so we did the economic, we did the automatic uh, system response, the physical system response. The social thing uh, is that cars, in a way, remove the driver from social forces. Tinted windows, or just the, the mere fact that we're in a box, 
it's air conditioned. I've got my radio on. Uh, I'm protected by metal, uh, by the steel frame, this glass, by airbags. I'm invincible. I am, I am a superhero. I am an individual. I am a cowboy. I can do whatever I want. There's something antisocial about that. And that's what we see in bad behaviors um, on the street, which we all are familiar with. There's also the question of the logic of the management of space. Um, the, the technical attitudes of functional separation that you studied with Corbusier. Oh, I shouldn't assume that. Corbusier, right, the functional city? Just say, just go like this. So the, the four functions of the modern city, residential, work, uh, recreation, and circulation. And so by segregating those four functions into different spatial realms, we create things like this. Residential is out there somewhere. Recreational is somewhere else out there. Um, this is the workplace, and this is circulation. When you have too much traffic and not enough parking, you build more lanes and you build more parking. And um, yet, at the same time, there's something weird happen. There's a homeostatic uh, relationship. The more roads you build, the more people will drive. And that is a scientifically proven fact. Um, whenever you add lanes to uh, a freeway, it quickly fills up. And so the logic of this is kind of a, a downward spiral. The more parking you provide, the more people drive, uh, to the point where Copenhagen, looking at this example, they said, uh, we know the solution to this problem. We're going to take the 14,000 parking places in downtown Copenhagen, and we're going to get rid of them. And we're going to do it secretly so no one notices. And that's what they did. Their bicycle usage uh, went up to 40% of trips became bicycles. Uh, and the downtown city area became a lovely place. And uh, it has to do with what happens when you convert these single-use spaces that are, this has this, uh, engineers were asked the question, how do we make roads safer? And the answer was, Traffic lights, stop signs, left turn lanes, median strips, uh, a safe zone without obstructions. So if people fall asleep, they can go veer off the road and they have a long stopping distance. So the, this is an example of a roadway that was engineered uh, for safety. Now, um, uh, but what happens when people feel safe on roads like this, what do you do when you're on a road like this? You step on the gas. And what happens if you drive at night, uh, you know, for three or four hours on a road like this? You fall asleep. And what happens, uh, you know, and the list goes on and on. Uh, and the reading for this topic um, is a very interesting, large book. Um, the chapter you're reading, uh, it's an easy read, so I gave you a, you know, it's a long, it's a full chapter. Um, it's quite long, but it's quite easy to read compared to other things you've read. Um, doesn't get into these issues, but basically, the safer you make the street, guess what happens to the accident uh, statistics for that street? It goes up. The accident, the death on streets like this is much higher than on streets that are technically engineered in a much less safe way. And the principle is called risk homeostasis. The less risky you make it appear, the more risk people take, especially young men with testosterone. Um, yes, Rand? I've heard that before, but wouldn't it just be like, wouldn't it more people just be traveling on that road than maybe some, so it's just the sheer numbers that people are going to cause more accidents? You would think, but it is uh, an accident rate per thousand people traveling. So that's taken into account. Um, and in the meantime, we create places that are hostile. You do not want to be this woman. And we did this, right? Was it, did I do this? That the more, 
the more traffic on the street, uh, the less social connection you have. But the other thing I didn't mention, the lower your housing values. The less traffic there is, the more connections you have, the more, the higher your, your house value is, the more likely you are to be successful in life. Uh, all kinds of things uh, flow from this, rather than a street with heavy traffic. Um, the strange thing about the present moment, and this ties into what we thought, you know, we were on a nice uh, trajectory there for a little while where we were going to go to Mars and then to Alpha Centauri, and we were going to colonize space and take our flying cars elsewhere. Every year, humans travel more and more and more. It has never reversed. Every year, the way humans travel more is by increasing the number of cars we own and by using those cars to travel further. Until recently, the number of cars, and usually especially in the United States, but for the first time in history, the number of cars and the amount of driving of Americans has gone down in the last few years. What's going on? And especially people your age. Some of you are not getting driver's licenses. Some of you are not buying cars. Some of you are not driving. Don't you realize that we have to keep the economy going? What are you thinking? So something's going on, and we don't quite understand it. Despite the fact that we are trying to sabotage our mass transit systems and defund them, like in Massachusetts, transit ridership keeps going up. We haven't had this many transit riders since the 1960s when people owned far fewer cars. Suddenly, walkability is the whole thing. When Felipe Delmont uh, comes in to give you a guest uh, class, he'll be talking about the city of the short steps. It used to be that humans would wake up in the morning and they, were, they would devote roughly one hour every day to getting where they need to go and come back. But then, in the unfolding of human history, here we are 20,000 years later, guess what we do? It's exactly the same. It has never changed. We still tend to spend about one hour of our day getting to where we need to go. If we live in a village, we walk to where we're going, and if it only took 10 minutes, then we walk home for lunch and then walk back, but we spend an hour a day walking or traveling or whatever. That's what we do. That seems to be a homeostatic boom. We always hit that. So if we do that walking, uh, we have a huge benefit. Because it turns out our happiness is very much connected to not what we know is true. Our happiness is connected to what surprises us. And if we commute by car, every day we get surprised by what form the traffic jam takes or what form the next accident takes. And it's usually a negative surprise. But if we're walking to where we're going, we tend to be happier. And there's a new, um, the Dutch, let's get to the Dutch. This is Monderman. You're going to read about him, so I'm going to skip him. Um, but the, the Vonerf uh, is the idea of uh, changing, uh, abandoning the single-use policy of space. There's a whole new movement called Complete Streets in the United States. It started with the Vonerf. Von means living, uh, Earth is space. So the living zone is called the Vonerf. Uh, the transformation of streets into places for human beings. Um, and this has been quite as successful. Um, Cars take up a lot of space. These are out of order. But the same number of people are transported in a bus takes up much less space. Um, that's the space that each person in their own car takes. Mixed traffic, it's already much better. And that's kind of what uh, is a healthy mix. Cars are never going away, um, but uh, They've transformed the spaces of stores. It used to be you have a store, uh, but then you had to provide parking for your store. But then, you know, so there's not much store left once you provide, satisfy the laws. So basically, these retail establishments in many places are now illegal. You cannot develop this anymore. The laws say you have to provide parking for your customers. So uh, that has severe implications. 
for the kind of world we live in. I'm going to skip that one. Um, there's all kinds of speculation about the driverless car. And uh, there's a chapter in the book that I'm not having you read that talks about how difficult it is to, to teach a computer how to drive. And basically, they gave up on trying to make up what-if statements. You know how programmers work? It's if, if A, then B, else C. So that's the basic algorithm of all programming. So when you hit a stop sign, stop. You know, it's that type of instructions. So there's a contest with multi-million dollar prize. Every year, uh, they set out a new track, and the contest is get a car to drive from this end to that end without uh, getting stuck or running into something. And so they finally are starting to, to be able to do this. And the way they're doing it is not by teaching it, uh, not by programming it in what-if statements. They teach, uh, the, the computer is programmed to learn from experience. So it's by using cybernetic, artificial intelligence, learning reflexive loops, that computers can actually learn how to drive. And uh, the, the cars that are winning these contests are the ones deploying reflexive loops. Um, John Travolta's house. Um, now, the punchline of this, in the context of this course, is if we're looking for human reflexive responses to physical environments, Driving seems to have forced us into dealing with exactly that. So we've changed the spatial configuration of our street environments to create these automatic responses. You've all seen, you've all whizzed by street signs, uh, speed limit signs that say speed limit 35 miles an hour. And you're going 45 miles an hour, right? Or 50 miles an hour. Nothing, you know, we all do it. But then, so they've, so they've switched. The new uh, right way to do this, in cities at least, is you skip the, the traffic sign. You skip the speed limit sign. You just give a physical, formal, you change the shape of the space. And this is a, a vertical deflection, otherwise known as a speed bump. This is one of the traffic calming measures we now employ in cities, where we send the signal, this intersection is for human beings. Cars, you can come in, but please be careful. Watch out for the humans. Uh, and we send them signals by, by horizontal deflections of these neck downs, so the street actually gets narrower. We change the level of the street surface, so it's at the level of the sidewalk. It sends the signal, this is for human beings, not for cars. You know, ask permission. Engage in a social negotiation before you cross this. Make sure no people are going to get hurt. And this is, um, I'm trying to get pictures of the Vonerf. In the Netherlands, uh, there are places for parking, but then there's these vast inner block areas where um, you can park there, but it's basically for people. And so you get um, these situations where it's a parking lot, yes, but it's also a patio. And it's a place for kids to play. And you do it all in this one place. Now, there are very, very, very few examples of this in North America. One of them is now in Cambridge, but another one is in the Northeastern Campus. The Northeastern Campus uses a lot of these tricks. They change the paving surface. Have you noticed that? That sometimes there's a car going down the walkway? That's what it feels like? That's what it's supposed to feel like. It's supposed to feel like the car, if you're the driver, you know, if you're on Ruggles, I told you, you know, don't ride your bike on Ruggles. That's for cars, okay? And if you have any doubts, try it. And they will tell you, you don't belong here. Get off the road or I'm going to run over you. Um, now, the Northeastern Campus has the other thing. You're in a, if you're in a car and you're driving through this, you're saying... The, the manner of your driving is like, oh, excuse me, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm driving through here. Please, uh, oh, please, go ahead. Uh, okay. You, it's very tentative. You're making eye contact with people. And so all of a sudden, the social mechanisms, you're not just hitting the brakes when someone is in front of you. You're engaging in a social negotiation. And so the part in the reading that you should look for 
is the part where Monderman uh, from the Netherlands um, says um, the best thing you can do to make traffic safer is to get rid of the traffic signs. Get rid of the stop signs. Get rid of the curbs that separate the street from the sidewalk. Get rid of it all. And by doing that, he's been able to take the traffic accidents from you know, 500 a year to 300 a year to 100 a year to 32. Uh, the results are stunning. And basically, you are sending, you're not telling people, uh, go slower. You are demonstrating that if you're going to go faster, there's going to be trouble. It would be impolite. So it turns out that social relationships are more powerful than threat of incarceration, threat of fine, threat of bodily harm. It's social mechanisms that actually uh, are the most important forces of the whole thing. And, uh, and so by doing the opposite of what our greatest architectural mind of the 20th century told us to do, uh, it actually solves all kinds of problems and makes uh, what had been a very negative, nasty situation into something much better. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's actually a very vivid and dramatic demonstration of how to identify these social reflexive feedback loops and, based on that new understanding, deploy those forces in a way that results in a more positive outcome. So if we can do that in the social space of, of our neighborhoods, what can we do architecturally uh, in our buildings? And so that's the challenge that the traffic example poses architects. Any questions? Yes, Parth. That might be an example that the, uh, the author does. Now, I just, I've just remembered I forgot this example. These are electronic bollards. This is a responsive architecture that when the bus goes through, they drop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's an automatic reflexive response. That, um, that, but it doesn't always work out so well. Um, but this is a very clear example of how uh, these electronic sensing devices, he's not pushing a button, he's just present. <laughs> Um, and you don't do that very many times before you learn, you know, you are conditioned to avoid them. <laughs> this is sad. I don't want to see this. Um, they have a kid in there? Yeah, I think they do. But, uh, so uh, it's also an example of what can go wrong.